Praise the Lord. I welcome everyone to the Leadership Strategy Congress this year in Jesus' name. And I pray that the Lord will impact your life. And the Lord will so revive every one of us that this work of the Lord will do it as if we are starting for the first time. And the power of the Lord will be in your life. Understanding in your life and the perception of the truth for you to move on and for you to do exploits for the Lord in this year, this coming year, the Lord will do it in your life in Jesus' name. Well, we start our Leadership Strategy Congress on the first week of the year. And I praise the Lord for those who are here. And for those who are connected with us all over Nigeria, all over Africa. And I thank the Lord for the readiness of mind to receive. You will receive. And also for the purpose of heart that the Lord himself will do something in you, recreate you, re-energize you, repackage you. You will not be as a wine the past years in Jesus' name. Cheerfulness. Joy. And you know, when you wear a dreary look, unhappy face, unhappy attitude, and then eternally you are down, it depresses you. Apart from affecting the people around you, so wear a happy face, have a good attitude, and know that this is a new year. My own new year has started already. And for those who are joining us for the Monday Bible study, we're here with our leaders from all over. And what our leaders are eating. And you know, sometimes at the end of the year, you have to bring all the little children and all the youths and all the young adults and father, mother, grandfather, grandmother. Bring everyone together and then we eat to celebrate the end of the year and the beginning of another year. So Bible study people, that's what we are doing today. We are bringing everybody together. God is going to do something in your life, in my life. In my family, the Lord will do wonders in Jesus' name. You are ready. I don't want you to ask if you are ready because I know you are ready. Ready to receive and ready to have impact in your world in Jesus' name. Let us ready people raise up their hands as we pray. Father, in the name of Jesus. We thank you for all our brothers and sisters at the Bible study. We thank you for all our ministers and workers at the Leadership Strategy Congress. Lord, we're praying this Congress, you'll do what you have never done. You reveal what you have never revealed. You impact every life in a new way in Jesus' name. You have revived us already. Revive your people again. And let your work prosper in our hands in Jesus' name. We will not look depressed. We will not think depressed. We will not act depressed. I will not allow the depression of the past years to affect us. Cheerfulness and happiness and joy will be our Lord in Jesus' name. Confirm your word in every life. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. God has blessed you. You can sit down. This year for our Congress, we're looking at the theme, the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ and getting ready for that. The Lord wants to prepare us, and I want you to understand, the disciples and the apostles that heard these words, 
in answer to their question. Look at it in Matthew chapter 24. He didn't sit back. He didn't say Christ is coming and then fold their hands the acts of the apostles. Chapter 1 through to chapter 28 followed after the revelation of the imminence of the coming of Christ. And so for us, as we learn about the coming of the Lord and we're preparing ourselves to be ready urgent readiness for Christ's return. We're going to switch on to the occupation and the commission the Lord has given us. Hearing about the coming of the Lord doesn't mean we're so okay, the time is over, the time is at an end, and Christ is coming very soon. So all I do is to prepare myself for that coming, for that return, for that rapture. We'll prepare ourselves and we'll prepare other people. The message we're having tonight, the urgency of readiness for Christ's return. The urgency of readiness for Christ's return. Matthew chapter 24. I'm reading from verse, 20, from verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Very lame, I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the mount of olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? When will these things be? All that you have said, all that you have been seen, and what shall be the sign of your coming? And what will be the sign of the end of the world? Understand? Learning about the coming of the Lord should make you, should make me, should make us, number one, men and women of secret prayer. To be ready to do what the Lord has ordained for us to do. Occupy till I come. And to be readily prepared, waiting for the coming of the Lord. To be a wise virgin and not a foolish virgin. Number one, a man, a woman, a leader, an overseer, a father, a mother, a child of secret prayer. Every time you have, every opportunity you have for more strength, for more grace, for great ability, a man, a woman of secret prayer. All through this Congress, as you come to listen, as you come to receive, as you come to go further in Christian experience than you have ever gone, a man, a woman of secret prayer. Number two, a man, a woman of soul-searching purity, fervent purity, deep purity, purity of heart that searches every area of your life, searches your very soul, and the people that see you, and the people that know you, and the people that sit by you, they get the fervency and the fire and the soul searching purity that you have. And if anybody carelessly 
makes any comment, jokes, jests, and appears that is living in the old time, old year, old life. Your soul searching purity will bring conviction upon everyone they shape up. Number three, you should be a man of a wo or a woman searching after spiritual power, the power of the Holy Ghost, and you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, in your Jerusalem, in your local church, in Judea, in Samaria, unto the uttermost part of the earth. The power of God will saturate every area of your life. The power of the Lord and of the Spirit will be so definite in your life, even without your talking, it will be oozing out. I did hear your amen. It should be men and women of scriptural passion. You see, there are people, their lives are dull. They look dull. Their carriage dull. It looks like the whole weight of the world is on their shoulders and they cannot walk they cannot run they cannot be fiery and the lord is calling us as he brings us to this congress and he's leading us to the coming year by the way tomorrow is our watch night service i said tomorrow is our watch night service I'm going to talk on something you've never heard. You will not sleep. 2020 20 vision. You'll see clearly. Your life will take on a new brightness in Jesus' name. Passion. Passion. I think about Moses and I see passion. He couldn't appear before Pharaoh and then be looking down. And then the shoulders dropped. And those, all those magicians were there. And the magicians were sure about themselves. And the magician was telling Pharaoh, don't mind him. Whatever he throws now, we will throw down. We can duplicate what he's trying to do. And then Moses to come as sluggishly, never a man of passion. I think of Joshua. In the midst of all those people, running after those Canaanites and they're walking as if there's arthritis on his waist, arthritis on his knees, arthritis in his ankle, and he cannot walk at all, never. Those men and women that God used in the past and is going to use you, my brother, is going to use you, my sister. They were not men that were sluggish and dull. They were people that had scriptural passion. You will have passion. They were people that had steadfast purpose. They had a purpose. Something to live for. Somebody has said, if you don't have anything to live for, you don't have anything was holding on unto in your life but men and women that had purpose in life and it was steadfast in purpose and any congress they attend any workers retreat they attend any planning meeting they attend any retreat they attend there is a purpose in their heart and that purpose they are steadfast about it and nothing will take that purpose away from them. Nothing will take this away from you in Jesus' name. Men and women of saintly perseverance. You know, in life, there are things that will cross your way. There are things that will try to bend you, break you. There are things that will try to stop you in the onward journey towards the kingdom there are things that will try to make you weak in the work the lord has committed into your hand but when you say 
there is nothing so great, so deep from the pit of hell that can hinder my progressive forward journey. That whatever comes, you brush it aside like a saint of God and you persevere. You will not die by the middle of the road. Perseverance. Moving on. I will move on. Perseverance going on. I will go on. And you go through. Every door you go through. This coming year, every door you will go through. These men and women preparing for the coming of the Lord and preparing to have a latter day ministry, a ministry that ushers them right to the presence of the Lord, the people of sound principles, people of sound principles, the principles are sound. They know why they are living. They know why they are serving. They know why they are preaching. They know why they are laboring. And they have the principle, only the best is good for my Lord, for my Savior, for my King. And because of that, nothing will water down their principle or their practice in Jesus' name. I submit to you. That as you come to this Congress, I submit to you that as you attend the Bible study today, that you make up your mind and you say, this coming year is going to mark a great difference in my life, in my ministry, in my service, in my local church, in everything that I do. I'll be a man, I'll be a woman, I'll be a brother, I'll be a sister of secret prayer, of soul searching purity. I'm waiting for you to just try that if you have not written it down. Of spiritual power, of scriptural passion, of steadfast purpose of saintly perseverance, of sound principles. That's me. That's me. The disciples came and they asked a question, a question coming from their heart. The Lord had been talking about his living, his dying, his being buried, is rising from the dead and has been talking about coming back again. Look at chapter 23 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 23. And I'm reading from verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that which are saints. Unto thee, how often would I have gathered thee, gathered my, thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh. They heard it is coming again. Blessed is he that cometh. He said, I'm coming back. You reject me now. You renounce me now. You betray me now. You crucify me now. You slay me now. You bury me now. I'll rise again. He rose again. And then he said, He is coming back again 
and you will see and you will say blessed is he that cometh in the name of the lord that's why now in chapter 24 they asked the question that they asked and that's why we're learning from the answer he gave on the urgency of readiness for Christ's return. As we look at these verses, there are three things we're looking at. Number one, the unalterable revelation of Christ's return. Unchangeable, unalterable revelation of Christ's return. Number two, the unreclaimable ruin before Christ's return. The unreclaimable ruin before Christ's return. He told them about the temple, all these buildings in the temple, not one stone will be left on the other. Everything will collapse. Everything will be scattered and it will be unreclaimable. Not only the temple, Jerusalem. Not only Jerusalem, the nation of Israel. Not only the nation of Israel, the whole world. There will be a ruin. There will be a devastation. There will be a destruction. Unreclaimable ruin before Christ's return. Number three. In the light of all that, in the light of what is revealed, our urgent readiness for Christ's return. Your own readiness, my own readiness, the readiness of the church, the readiness of everyone that wants to spend the eternal future with Christ in heaven. Our urgent readiness for Christ's return. Number one, the unalterable, unchangeable revelation of Christ's return. Christ's return is a revelation. He himself had made that revelation before this time. That's why they were now asking if you are returning. Look, I've been saying over and over and over. When will that be? What will be the sign that you are returning? Let's look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 27. Revelation of his return. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 27, it says in verse 27, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his holy angels, and then... He shall reward every man according to his works. It's coming again. Let there be no doubt in your mind, in your heart. Whatever you see all around you, know for a certainty of the revelation of Christ that is coming again. He will come again. I said he will come again. Luke chapter 9 we're reading from verse 26. Luke chapter 9. We're reading from verse 26. In Luke chapter 9, verse 26, For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come. Is coming and he revealed to them with many infallible proofs, with many infallible, unalterable proclamations, he will come again. 
and it says over here, it shall come in his glory and in his father's glory and of the holy angels. Luke chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 35. I'm showing you that before they asked the question, in the last week of his presence with them, he had already told them over and over he was coming again. That's why now they ask the question, when? What's the sign of your coming? And you ought to know, as we're living your life, you ought to know every time you wake up in the morning, Christ may come today. And you live your life and you offer the message of salvation to others and you live in such a way that you are sure of the revelation of the Lord, He, Christ, He, the Savior, He, our Lord and Master, is coming again. Luke chapter 12, verse 35. In verse 35, here the Lord again is speaking. Let your loins be gathered about, and your lights burning, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord. It's coming. He says, buckle up. He says, tighten your belt. He says, put on your garment of righteousness and your garment of praise. He says, get ready. And be like men that are waiting for their Lord. Don't be like the people that have no hope. Don't be like the people that are waiting for nothing. But you are waiting for your Lord when he will return from the wedding. That when he comes, you see that? That when he comes, that when he comes and knocks, they shall open unto him immediately immediately you will open unto him he says blessed are those servants whom when the Lord when the Lord cometh as he comes shall find watching verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come, he's repeating it again, over and over, Christ is coming, our Lord is coming, and that revelation of his coming it's on all trouble. Who is going to alter that? Satan cannot alter it. Evil spirits cannot alter it. Men and women on earth opposed to his coming cannot alter it. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious deceivers in the world cannot reverse it. He's coming again. Verse 38, and if he shall come, in a second watch or come in a third watch and find them so blessed at those servants for such a nine and know this that if the good man of the house had known in what hour the thief would come he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also for the Son of Man cometh. Have you seen how many times he repeats that? He comes, he will come for the Son of Man cometh when ye think not 
as we know now that is coming and nothing can change that coming the revelation of his return what do we do what are we supposed to be doing I wish to pack our loads, dress up in our best clothes, clothing, and then go and stay in Jerusalem, looking up, and they say, what are you doing? My Lord is coming. I come over here, and he's going to appear. And because this is where you went, and I'm staying here now, I wait to wait in idleness. Luke chapter 19, reading from verse 10. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. The reason why he came the first time, and the reason why he made the sacrifice he made, the reason why he died on the cross of Calvary is so that he will save the lost. He will save the sinner. That's what brought you, that's what brought me into the kingdom. Salvation through Christ. Redemption through Christ. Forgiveness through the washing and the cleansing of his blood. And the writing of our names in the book of life in heaven. He saved us. That's why he came. But now he has left. What's the reason he has left you here? What's the reason he has left me here? Verse 11. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable. And because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. They didn't see the period of the church age. They just saw his first coming and then his second coming immediately. They didn't see the period in between the first coming and the second coming. And so they thought that the coming of Christ and the coming of the kingdom should immediately appear. That's why he said, Therefore unto them, a certain noble man went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. The Son of Man is pictured in the personality of that noble man. He goes to a far country, he's gone to heaven, he's going to return. And now that we know that he's going to return, and that return is on all trouble, that revelation is unchangeable, and that declaration is irreversible. What are we now to do? Verse 13, And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. Occupy till I come. He's gone away. And he says, We shall not wait in idleness. Occupy till I come. Come, John chapter 14, the unalterable revelation of Christ's return. John chapter 14, reading from verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Believe in God that what he had said about me will be accomplished. Believe in me 
that everything I have said, like I said, I'm coming again. Believe in me. Everything I have said will come true. It's unchangeable. It's irreversible. It's unalterable. Verse 2. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Search disciples, followers, Christians. There's no time in my life here on earth I have been idle. I have been laid back. I have been slothful. And as I go to heaven, I'm not going there to say everything is over now. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And when I finish preparing the place for you, I will come again. But in my absence, while I'm preparing the place for you, and I'm doing it with passion, with purpose, with perseverance. You two down here below must be preparing yourself for the place with passion, with purpose, with perseverance. Then he says in verse 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I will come again. He said over and over that was coming back and is coming back. Has he ever lied? Has he ever deceived? Has he ever told something that is false and not true? No, he's coming again. That revelation is on all trouble. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you will be also. Where are believers going to spend eternity? On earth? Where? Where are you going to spend eternity? Where? Praise God, you'll be there. Point number two now. The unreclaimable ruin before Christ's return. Before he comes, all that men have spent years gathering together will be brought down, devastated, destroyed, scattered. Come back to Matthew chapter 24, verse 2. And Jesus said unto them, See ye all these things? Verily I say unto you, that there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. If you remember the history and the story of the building of that temple, they said 46 years did the people of Israel spend in building that temple. There were massive stones that were quarried and they were brought to the building and of magnet, magnificent shape and gold and silver spent, lavished on the building of the temple. And it was the pride of the children of Israel. In fact, they said, 46 years, this temple was in building. Are you going to destroy it and raise it up in three days? They deliberately misunderstood, misconstrued, misinterpreted the words of Jesus. Whatever that 
means to them is going to be an unreclaimable ruin, destruction, devastation of that temple. Beyond that, there's going to be the ruin, the devastation, the destruction of even the city itself, Jerusalem. Beyond that, there is going to be the ruin, the destruction of the whole nation before the coming of the Lord. Beyond that, there's going to be an unreclaimable ruin of the whole earth before the coming of the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 26. In Jeremiah chapter 26, we're reading from verse 18. Jeremiah 26, reading from verse 18. In verse 18, Micah the Morash site prophesied in the days of Hezekiah king of Judah and spake unto the people of Judah saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Zion shall be ploughed like a field. And Jerusalem shall become heaps, and the mountain of the house as the high places of a forest. The prophets have prophesied, even before the time, that devastation, ruin, collapse, destruction was coming upon Jerusalem, upon Zion, Upon Israel, upon that whole nation, Micah chapter 3, verse 12, Micah chapter 3, verse 12, the temple will be destroyed, Jerusalem will be destroyed, Israel will be destroyed, the whole world will be destroyed. There's going to be devastation, destruction scattering, ruin before the coming of the Lord. Micah chapter 3 verse 12 Therefore Zion for your sake shall be ploughed as a field for your sake for your sin for your evil that nation forsook their God and they took things for granted and they were taking pride now in their temple, in their cities, in their walled cities. And he said, for your sake, because of your iniquity, because of your transgression, because of your turning your back against your God, therefore shall Zion, for your sake, be ploughed as a field, and Jerusalem shall become heaps. And the mountain of the house, of, of the house as the high places of the forest. Ezekiel chapter 7. Ezekiel chapter 7. All that you see in the world will soon come to ruins. And if your heart is inside the mortar, inside the cement, inside the building, if your love, if your passion, if your goal, if everything you have, if your joy is bound with the things of the world, when everything collapses, then your life will collapse. I pray your heart will not collapse with the world. Ezekiel chapter 7, reading from verse 21. Ezekiel 7, verse 21. And I will give it into the hands of the strangers for a prey and to the wicked of the earth for a spoil, and they shall pollute it. 
my face will I turn also from them, and they shall pollute my secret place, for the robbers shall enter into it and defile it. That is the prophecy that man of God, Ezekiel, gave Daniel chapter 9. In Daniel chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 26, Daniel 9, reading from verse 26, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come. That's of the Antichrist. The people of the prince that shall come. The army of the Antichrist that shall come. Shall destroy the city. Not just the temple. But the city. And the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. You see that? Desolation, destruction, devastation determined. The Lord Jesus made allusion to that in his revelation. In Luke chapter 19, Luke chapter 19, the ruin coming upon the city, the ruin coming upon the temple, the ruin coming upon the nation, upon the world too. Luke chapter 19, verse 41. And when he came near, he beheld the city, and he wept over it, saying, If thou art known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now the heat from thine eyes. The people at that time looking at their stately temple and they took pride in that. They didn't see any reason to think of Christ who is the Lord of the temple and the Lord of the altar. And the same thing with the people on earth today. As you look at people celebrating, they, although they are saying that there's not enough money to buy this and to buy that, yet they still celebrate in a way. And they think they say, the only thing they can remember about Christ is that he was born at a particular time. And they have set a particular date for that birth. And it's the time of merriment and the time of eating and the time of singing and the time of dancing and the time of throwing parties. But they do not think of their peace. All that the children of Israel rejoiced about, everything came to a ruin. All that the people of the world are rejoicing about today, everything will come into ruin because they have not known the time of their peace is hidden from their eyes. Verse 43, for the days shall come upon thee that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even to the ground of the ground. Bring the buildings, level them, destroy them. Bring the temple, 
level them to the ground and shall lead thee, even thee, even unto the, to the ground and thy children within thee. And they shall not live in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. See what Jesus proclaimed, what Jesus prophesied. Yes, he spoke about his coming. And that coming is real. It's irreversible. But he also spoke about the ruin, about the destruction, about the devastation of everything they took pride in. Verse 45, and he went into the temple and began to cast out them that sold therein. The Lord has assured us that he's coming again. And when he comes, or before he comes, there'll be an unreclaimable ruin of the world in which we live. We're looking at Luke chapter 21. In Luke chapter 21, reading from verse 22. Luke 21, reading from verse 22. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled, but woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And it shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. The Lord revealing that the temple will be ruined, the city will be ruined, the nation will be ruined, and the people will be scattered before the coming of the Lord. And so, as we learn about the coming of the Lord, we don't just learn and stuff our heads with knowledge. It should get to our hearts. And then we should be thinking, you know, what happens when he comes? What happens before he comes? If we're prayerless, if we're purposeless, if we're unprofitable, if we're not thinking about his coming, not preparing, all this devastation will take us on our ways. Look at that verse again, verse 24. In verse 24, it says, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led the way captive into all nations. Devastation, scattering, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth. Before he comes, and upon the earth, and upon the earth, distress of nations, and perplex with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear. Because of the disaster, because of the devastation, because of the destruction, 
because of the ruin, irreversible ruin, before he comes, men's hearts will be failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, not only on the temple, on the earth, not only on Jerusalem, on the earth, not only on Israel. Then he says, as it comes, those things on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming. The ruin first, the devastation first, the destruction first, the destabilization first, the distress on all nations first, before the man, before the Son of Man comes in a cloud of power and great glory. What are we to do about that? But to make sure that we're prepared so that we're not swept away, swept off with the devastation coming before it's coming. In Second Peter chapter three, verse eleven. Second Peter chapter three, reading from verse eleven, seeing them that all these things shall be dissolved. The temple dissolved. Jerusalem, the capital city of Israel, dissolved. All the things in the world dissolved. Look at verse 10. Verse 10. For the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the element shall melt with fervent heat and the earth also not only the temple not only jerusalem not only israel and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt up seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and uh, godliness? It says, we don't just learn about all these revelations and then fold our hands and stay the same and act the same and live the same. When I should live in all holiness, godliness, and righteousness. Point number three now, our urgent readiness for Christ's return. He comes again. He's coming again. He predicted it. He prophesied it. And now he's telling us, that we need to do something in about that for ourselves, for our house fellowship members, for the people on our leadership in the zone, for the people in our local church in the district, for the people under our leadership in the group, for the people, members of the church and members in our regions, and members in our states and members in our nations and to do something for our neighbors for the sinners those who, not, who do not know the lord and we should allow the revelation of his coming again to bring fire within us and put fire in our bones that we will not stay quiet we will not stay idle we will do something because there's urgent readiness necessary before Christ's return. Luke chapter 21. In Luke chapter 21, verse 28. Luke chapter 21, reading from verse 28. 
And when these things begin to come to pass, the devastation of the temple, devastation of the city, devastation of the nation, devastation of the world, and all the earthquakes and everything we're reading about today, when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your hands, for your redemption draws near. Look up. Don't look down. Look up. Don't look back. Don't be like Lord's wife who looked back and became a pillar of salt. Don't be like the people that look down. They're taking their shovel. They're digging the ground. And they are amassing wells. All they can look at is the sand and stone that they're digging up and bringing together. Look up for redemption draws near. Let me take an illustration from the children of Israel. Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. They had been in the land of Egypt for many years, but now they escape. Their going out was very near. And so everything they did, they should do with urgency. If you are to be saved, make it urgent. You are to be sanctified, make it urgent. You have some restitutions to make. And the Lord has been telling you, this thing is hanging. This thing is there. And I'm coming very soon. And this restitution is important. Your life is flabby. Your life is scattered. There is guilt. There is condemnation. And you need to rectify this thing. Do it urgently. Is it in your marriage? Is it in your business? Is it in your lifestyle? Look, look at all the signs that we see. And it tells us Christ is coming again. Are you owing debt deliberately? And you are not caring. And you are not paying. And it says, oh no man, anything. Are you oppressing people? Are you imprisoning people? Are you doing something that the people are crying unto God for you? Saying, O oh Lord, deliver me from this man. This is the time to make Christ your life. Our urgent readiness for Christ's return. Look at Exodus chapter 12. I read from verse 11. Exodus chapter 12, verse 11. And thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, and your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And ye shall eat it in haste, in haste. There's no time to waste. It's not the time to bear grudge. This is not the time to have unforgiving spirit. This is not the time to live and drown yourself in hatred. This is not the time to destroy your life with grudges and grumbling and hatred. Be in haste and get rid of those things. The Lord is coming. Look at verse 33. In verse 33, and the Egyptians were urgent upon the people. The people themselves were making haste, and the Egyptians themselves, they were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we'll be all dead men. As we see the devastations and the destruction, and we see all the things happening around us, this is not the time to dilly-dally. This is not the time to delay. 
our response to the coming king. Urgency, haste, passion, being quick and firm to do what needs to be done. This is the time to think about heaven, to think about the rapture, to think about the return of our Lord, and to think about have I done everything I should have done? Or if it comes today, will I regret? Oh, what I, sh what I should have done. Oh, the apology I should have made. Oh, the restitution I should have made. Oh, the sanctification I should have had. Oh, the power of the Holy Ghost I should have received. Oh, the urgency of the work and the passion for the work I should have done. Oh, the obedience I should have given unto the Lord. This is the time of urgency. Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse 60. I made haste, I delayed not to keep thy commandments. He commanded us to love, to love God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our might. This is not the time to say, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it another time. He commands us to love one another as Christ has loved us. This is not the time to say, I'll do it, but I must retaliate first. I do it, but I must get even first. I, I do it, but I must show him, show her, that I'm not a foolish Christian. I must show him and show her that I will strike him first before I now manifest love. I have something to grind now. This is not the time to say, I can't make restitution now. I can't be gentle now. I can't be loving now. I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. Look at Proverbs chapter 27. Proverbs chapter 27. I'm reading from verse 1. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. The Lord said, The day and the hour when Christ will come is not known to any man, not even to the angels of God in heaven, but to my Father only. And so nobody will say, I know it will not come now. I know it cannot come now. I must still have my way. I must still do my own will. I must still go the broad way. I must still tell a lie. I must still do whatever I like to do. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. For thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. You do not know. When Christ will come, you do not know when it will be that day and that hour. Look up for your redemption. Draw it nice. If you have gone through all the programs you have been having, and you are not sure of your salvation, what are you going to be sure? If you have gone through all that God is impacting into our lives, and you do not have the holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, when will you have that holiness? If you have gone through all the things the Lord has been doing in our midst, and you have not taken a moment to pray for the sanctification, for the purity of heart, for the holiness of life, you don't even take time to pray about it. If you don't pray about it, how can you have it? When are you going to do it? If you've been hearing about working for the Lord and giving your very best to the Lord, my son, give me your heart and let your eyes delight in my ways and give yourself fully, entirely, or reservedly unto God. 
and you have never done that and pledged your life and pledge everything you have and your skill unto the Lord and the Lord alone. When are you going to do it? Ecclesiastes chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 10. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Put all your energy, all your power, all your skill, everything you've got into what you're doing. Be wide awake and bring your heart and bring your strength and bring your training and bring your very best into what he calls you to do. He's called us to occupy until he comes. He calls us to evangelize. He's, call, he's called us to take this word, the gospel, and preach the gospel to every creature. He says, don't just do it once in a while. He says in that verse 10, do it with your mind. For there is no work, no device, no knowledge, no wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. After Christ has come, there's nothing else you can do. And if you don't do what needs to be done now, you put your finger in your mouth and regret, regret, regret forever. Even if you are able to get to heaven by the skin of your teeth, even if you are able to get to heaven, almost missing it, but getting there. No reward. No appreciation, no recognition. You'll be like the lowest of the lowest, even if you're able to get there. Because there is nothing to reward. What's he going to reward? Carelessness. What's he going to reward? He's going to reward the coldness, the lukewarmness, and the lack of interest. What's he going to reward? Is he going to reward your unfaithfulness? You'll be the lowest of the lowest. But if you realize he's giving you another day, maybe another week, maybe another month, that before he comes, you sink everything you've got into serving the Lord. I pray we'll be wise now. I will be wise now. The Lord confirm it to your life in Jesus' name. Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, verse 24. Strive to enter in. Don't strive to hinder others entering in. Don't strive with others entering in. Don't strive to delay others entering in. The good you want for yourself desire it for other people strive to enter in at the straight gate for many i say unto you will seek to enter in and shall not be able when once the master of the house is risen up and has shut the door and ye begin to stand without outside and to knock at the door. They are knocking too late. It says, ask. It says, seek. It says, knock. But they are knocking too late. And to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence ye are. I pray you'll not hear those words on the final day in Jesus' name. Genesis chapter 19. In Genesis chapter 19, I'm reading here from verse 12. Genesis chapter 19. Reading from verse 12. It says in verse 12, And the men 
the angels who appear like men, said unto Lord, Hast thou here any besides son in law? And thy sons and thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in this city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out, hold on. The Lord has commissioned me. Have I anyone here on earth? Have I anyone here in the city? Have I anyone there at the Bible study? Have I anyone there at the Congress? Have I anyone here at the Congress that I know, that I love, that serve, that help, that are sweaty in serving the Lord, serving the church, serving me, serving the people of God, go tell them that the end of this world is about to come and the coming of the Lord is very near. Tell them to prepare and come out of the world and come out of this place. All the pollutions of the world, all the practices of the world, all the pornography of the world, all the evil defilement in the world, go tell them, come out. And that is what I've been trying to do. You will not stay back in the world. You will not perish with the world. You will not tie yourself with the rope of disobedience and rebellion and rejection and transgression until there's no way to come out you will come out and Lord went out and spake unto his sons in law which married his daughters and said up oh, get you out of this place for the Lord will destroy the city the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem the destruction of the city, Jerusalem. The destruction of the nation, Israel. The destruction, devastation, and ruin of the whole world, of the earth, is about to take place. It's already taking place. Already taking place. And it's speeding up in quick succession. For the Lord will destroy this, this place. But... He seemed as one that mocked unto his sons in law. And maybe there are people there that all we read from Scripture is like we're playing games. It's like we're doing religion. It's like we're gambling. It's like what else will he say? And because of that, we're used to carelessness. We're used to prayerlessness. We're used to not making restitution. We're used to hardening our hearts. I pray today as you hear his voice, you will not harden your heart. Verse 15, And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lord, saying, Arise, take thy wife, and I took daughters which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of this city. And while he lingered, the men laid holes upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters. How about all those hearts men? That Lot and uh, Abraham had. And Lot separated because of all those earth's men. I can't find them now. 
I have told those people that served him. And because of that, he said, Abraham, bye-bye. I can't find them. Did he escape? I have told the people that may be following you. And because of that, you have an axe to grind with the leadership. When Christ will come, where will you be? And where will they be? And it says, the Lord be merciful unto him. And he brought them forth and set him without the city. And it came to pass, when they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou. In all the plain, escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. There's no time to argue with the angel now. There's no time to argue with the scriptures now. There's no time to argue with the revelation of Christ coming now. Our escape is urgent. Salvation is urgent. Holiness without which any man shall see the Lord is urgent. And you are a pastor. You are fighting with your members. You are a pastor. You are quarreling with your members. You are a pastor. You are beating and knocking and driving your members. You are a pastor. You want them to honor you more than they honor Christ. And you pounce on them. There's no time for that now. Apologize to your congregation. Apologize to whoever. And be like a child again and go back to Calvary and say, I want to be ready when the Lord will come. You'll be ready in Jesus' name. Thus, no amen should be extraneous. I'm preaching the word of God unto you. I told you at the retreat, amen is a sacred word. And when we say amen, we're not say, saying amen to distract other people. This is deeper Christian life ministry. We don't joke with the word of God. And don't be a stranger in the midst of the people of God. The Lord will make us to hear the word of God and be abiding in the word in Jesus' name. As you look at verse 26, as the angels had declared unto them, escape to the mountain. Don't look back. Look at verse 26. But the wife, his wife, looked back from behind him and became a pillar of salt. And Jesus said, remember, Lord's wife, you will remember. You will not go back. You will not slide back. Your mind, your focus, your goal will be that you make it at the time of the Lord's return. You will not perish for the perishing world. It's urgent. The urgency of readiness for Christ's return is giving us revelation on all trouble. It's shown us there's going to be the ruin of the earth, unreclaimable. And now he says, prepare, get ready, it's urgent, make your way right, be holy, be ready. May God make every one of us ready in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, you want to be ready. Raise your voice to the Lord. Raise your voice to the Lord. You don't know the day, the hour, the moment, the minute when you will come. Let him find you ready, prepared. Holy, righteous, sanctified, ready when he comes.